27th conference of the parties will take place in Egypt this November. The so-called African COP will be the first major climate conference in the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The war had had implications on global energy markets. Much attention has focused on how African countries from the Cape up to the Mediterranean have reacted to the shock wave. For many years now, we have heard that fossil fuels must go, but suddenly European countries are hunting high and low for natural gas, including in Africa. This dash for gas has exposed double standards in energy access and achieving climate goals. What opportunities might resource-rich African states have in these tumultuous times? And how will this affect African governments and citizens' agenda uh, at the COP27? Welcome to the Resource Remix, a podcast from the Natural Resource Governance Institute. We bring listeners dynamic perspective on the cutting edge issues affecting countries rich in commodities in the context of energy transition. I am Silas Olam. I have been with NRGI for more than a decade and now serve as the organization's Africa Energy Transition Advisor based in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Two guests join me today to, deliver, uh, to dive into the uh, prospects for African countries in this new energy market landscape. Our first guest speaking to us from London is Carol Nakle. Carol is an energy economist, founder and chief executive officer, Crystal Energy, an advisory and research firm, and a member of NRGI governing board. Carol, welcome to NRGI podcast. Hello, Silas. I'm very happy to join you today. Thank you. Uh, we also welcome Tio Achimpong. Tio is an economist and political risk analyst and a lecturer at the University of Dundee in Scotland, where he is speaking to us from today. Tio, you're most welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Thank you both so much for joining me in this episode. So Russian evasion has prompted moves by many countries to reassess their reliance on Russian oil and gas and reduce their dependence on its imports. Many articles has, have sprung up with the commentators discussing how world leaders desperate for energy are turning to Africa for its reserve and uh, of oil and gas, considering them as potential beneficiaries of uh, Europe's supply gap. In many, the EU published, in May, the EU published uh, its energy strategy, but the strategy leaves many unanswered questions. Carol, um, now that it has uh, taken some months uh, since the initial market shock, what is a clear-eyed view of the coming two to three years? Are some African countries likely to profit from the current context or of increased European demand? If so, which countries and in which way? Thank you, Silas. Well, first of all, before I answer the question, it's very, very important to, to clarify to the listeners and viewers that the crisis we are seeing today in Europe and elsewhere, because not just high prices that we are seeing currently in Europe, but also in Asia and even North America, we're seeing record gas prices. It's not caused by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. It is, of course, that factor that geopolitical development plays a very important role, but it would be naive to blame at all on the war because there are some dynamics that have happen been happening in gas markets over decades 
including the development of LNG trade, which I think last year or 2020, but probably last year, if I'm not mistaken, for the first time ever overtakes pipeline trade. So there is this globalization of gas markets. Of course, we are very far from what we have in oil markets, but with the fact that you have more LNG trade happening than originally markets that were independent of each other. So European would not really care about what was happening to the Asians. The Asian wouldn't care about what was happening in North America. This is not the case anymore today. Today, if Asia sne catches a cold, Europe sneezes because of LNG trade. So that's very important. I'm saying that right up front because it has implications for existing and potential producers, especially ex exporters of LNG, to whether by pipeline, for example, North Africa to Europe or LNG exporters, including in West Africa, but even more so in East Africa with the likes of Mozambique. They will be facing a completely different market than, for example, what they faced a few years ago. Now, to go back to your question about the outlook for uh, gas situation in Europe, what does that mean for African producers? current and future, and I insist on future because we shouldn't underestimate the role that East Africa will, come, will play in the next few years. But first of all, in the short term, so if I focus about this winter because gas demand increases in winter in Europe, I am more pessimistic because you're going to see, you know, usually gas demand increase around this time. And if winter is going to be as cold as it was a year ago, then we should expect actually the most important uh, consequence that is higher prices. And we're already seeing record prices across Europe. And then in the longer term, so after that, things should start to ease up. But, you know, I'm an economist. So I have to say that high prices may be the solution to high prices. And I say it may be because it depends also on what governments are doing. And Silas, you highlighted that in your opening remarks about the kind of uh, contradictions that we are seeing and new turns that we are seeing. Because let me give you an example. For years, if not decades, uh, the rich countries, the OECD countries, blamed or reprimanded the developing countries for giving subsidies to their people, energy subsidies, fossil fuel subsidies. Guess what? They are doing exactly the same today, giving subsidies to the rich and poor alike. So that is one aspect I had to get it off my chest because it really bothers me as an economist. But if we think about high price signal, that is pushing consumers to adjust their demand. They, they are looking for alternative. They are even thinking about which room to congregate into the winter and not avoid using other rooms in the house if they have more than one room, let's say, in a house. You are seeing at a bigger scale the switching from gas to alternative source of energy. Nuclear is one option, renewable is another option. But ironically, we are seeing a shift to coal. We are seeing a shift to oil products such as diesel. So that's another reversal in climate change policies and energy policies we are seeing in Europe. And they are scrambling to find alternatives for supplies coming from Russia because Russia for decades has been the largest or was maybe today it's not anymore the largest supplier of gas to the continent. But that means, you know, maybe on the face of it, you would say, okay, that's great. That will be opportunities for African gas producers. But there are two things I want to highlight here. First, they are not the only one eyeing the European markets. You have American LNG, increased by more than 70% compared to last year for the first quarter of this year. They, they love to send their gas to Europe and don't forget the American sanctioned Nord Stream 2, the pipeline coming from Russia to Europe from last year. So it's not after the war, it was long before the war started. So for the Americans, European market is very attractive. So African producers will, be, will have to face the reality that there will be greater competition from the Middle East, Qatar, for example, from elsewhere, everybody wants to send their gas to Europe. But the second thing, and this is a big question, does Africa has the capacity to increase its exports beyond what they have today? Let me focus on North Africa and I leave it there and I'll let Cleo maybe uh, elaborate more on Sub-Saharan Africa. But look at Algeria, look at Egypt, especially Algeria, its export potential has been declining because its production has not been rising as fast as its consumption. So local consumption has been growing very fast because of different, you know, unattractive, you know, irrational policies, economically speaking. And as a result, if they don't keep up with investment, if they don't keep up with increasing production, and they don't slow down the growth in demand, I think we should be realistic about how much more Africa can send to Europe. I'll leave it there and we can elaborate on the rest later on.
Thank you very much, uh, Caro. So uh, from what you're saying, several established producers, you know, Algeria, Angola, and Nigeria seems already well positioned to benefit from this demand uh, as they are already reaping higher revenues from the spike uh, in the oil and gas prices. Uh, countries with projects due to start within the next uh, uh, year or so, such as Mauritius and Senegal, I think uh, they will likely uh, also benefit from the higher prices. Um, others, on the other hand, where investment decisions on key LNG projects are still pending, could end up you know, suffering a large financial risk than benefits. I'm thinking of Mozambique, for example, um, given security challenges, and of course, my own country, uh, Tanzania, uh, due to ongoing negotiations and outstanding project design processes. Is, 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 is there uh, a risk of heightened expectations not being made for certain producer countries, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa? And what are the risks associated uh, for some of countries in attempting to meet European demand? And Theo, I would really like to hear your views on this. Uh, thank you very much. Uh... Silas, uh, and uh, again, um, pleasure to be here. I mean, let me also maybe start with a much more broader level remark, and then we can look at the specifics. Um, I think what, what is interesting is that we live in quite extraordinary times. Um, in, in my relatively short life, I have seen at least three crises, uh, if not maybe four, from the financial crisis of 2008-9, and then the commodities price lump of 2014 to 17. Then we had COVID and just as the recovery was gaining momentum, now we're dealing with the aftershocks of the uh, Russia-Ukraine uh, war or conflict. Um, and of course that has had some um, major rep repercussions uh, in terms of the uh, global energy uh, geopolitics or the dynamics. I mean. For me, what is kind of interesting, as you really allude to in the opening remarks, is the fact that uh, there seems to be a change in tone only from a year ago when a lot of the European and Western nations were saying, you know, we're going all net zero and the environment is the key consideration. But rather, we've seen energy security and issues of access and affordability becoming the dominant team in the you know, uh, global energy debate uh, going forward. And of course, some have even said that it's quite hypocritical in, in a sense that uh, some of the developing countries, including those in Africa, haven't been given as much uh, of an opportunity to also develop their own uh, domestic energy resources, which are mostly fossil fuels, uh, by the way. But I think, then the tone has changed. Um, and um, because Europe especially is looking to fill its um, energy supplies with alternative sources, um, Africa then of course comes strongly um, into, the, into the question. Um, and um, as you rightly pointed out, um, in terms of the gap or the size that needs to be filled, I think maybe a couple of numbers would sort of maybe help here uh, to put things in, in better context. And then we look at specifically um, which Af Sub-Saharan African countries are likely to benefit, if so, when and, and how. Um, uh, so we know that Russia uh, has about 17% uh, of the world production of natural gas. I checked the, some numbers, it's about 25 uh, TCF and about 40% of the European or EU import uh, historically has come from uh, Russia. Um, if we look at the African context, uh, Africa has just about 7% of the world um, production of uh, natural gas. Um, uh, they're expecting to actually ramp this up to about uh, 350 
um, a billion cubic meters or 12.4 TCF. The uh, earlier production is about 9 TCF. Um, and if you actually look at how much the size of the gap is, I don't think that uh, African countries would actually be able to fill that in the short term. Um, so there are a number of issues, uh, but it really comes down in my view to about four, some of which Carol talks about. The first one being the availability of spare capacity or how much uh, countries would really be able to ramp up their production in even the one year to be able to augment the sort of supply deficit that the Europeans are, are looking for. And related to that also is issues of uh, logistics and infrastructure. So if I take Nigeria, for example, which has uh, the highest gas reserves uh, on in Africa at about 207 uh, TCF, uh, last year they were only able to actually produce two, two TCF and exported one TCF out of that. And predominantly it comes down to financing issues. It comes down even to do with issues of um, uh, theft of uh, petroleum products um, and including the landscape or the regulatory landscape not being fully uh, harmonized. So I, I think it's not really a problem of reserves per se, uh, but really how fast African countries can ramp up that production. And this is where I think given the logistical issues, given that the gas markets are not fully formed, I don't really see any potential beneficiaries in at least the one year outlook. I think, of course, we've seen uh, Italy trying to negotiate for more gas from the likes of Algeria and, and Egypt, and some production may go up. But uh, in terms of Sub-Saharan Africa, when I look at Nigeria or Equatorial Guinea or Mauritania, Senegal or Mozambique and Tanzania, or even um, uh, Republic of Congo, I, I think in the, in the one year, highly unlikely. Beyond that, in maybe the two to three, you can even say four years, there is a possibility of that happening. But again, it takes a lot to develop these gas projects and policy will play a role, regulation will play a role, and ultimately even the direction of the war will play a role in terms of these uh, alternative supplies from the likes of uh, the US and uh, the other Middle Eastern countries who are able to much more quickly ramp up capacity and take market share. Thank you very much. Um, so yes, uh, the capacity uh, is, is, is a real issue. And of course, we, we looking into one year, two years is, is okay. But there is a big question as to, you know, um, how long will Europe continue, you know, uh, 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 demanding for gas, given that they are also developing their own um, energy uh, transition. So. Indeed, Europe is looking for gas now, uh, and not necessarily in long term, uh, which may lead, you know, uh, to a, a disconnect somehow. Because uh, we're looking at one hand, uh, you know, the capacity gap requires significant investment in Africa, for example, of, uh, producing countries. On the other hand, uh, Europe is also, uh, you know, going for other countries, as you mentioned, US and whatever. So um, I, I think Europe is looking really for uh, renewables as well. And this is a, where the disconnect is. This is a warning, you know, uh, to gas producing countries in Africa uh, when setting their priorities. As you talk about setting up the policies, uh, but if they are setting the policies, looking into the uh, European market, while actually uh, the European market, uh, again, try to uh, focus on, on renewables, uh, what, what, what does this mean in terms of a long-term, you know, um, engagement with, with, uh, with, 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 with Europe uh, from African producer countries. Uh, and and uh, I would be happy to hear from Carol and, and also Tio if you wanna 
chime in. Well, Silas, what you're touching on is a very, very important question that I asked myself recently when I wrote an article on policy confusion that we are seeing across the Western countries, in particular in the EU and also in North um, America and the UK as well. In the sense that we see these governments are asking oil companies, are asking oil and gas producers across the world, including Africa, to produce more uh, oil and gas and send it across to Europe to help them temporary with the crisis. But as we all know, oil and gas projects are by their very own nature long term. So by the time you take the investment decision to commit the capital, then it will take a couple of years before you start producing. And then you're not going to produce for a year or two, you're hoping to produce for the next 20, 30 years. And if the outlook for that 20, 30 years is hugely uncertain, then why would you bother and commit today? So this is really the, the, the fair position and questioning that existing producers are telling those consumers, are telling them, we want your gas, but only to help us through the crisis, to help us through this winter and maybe next until we beef up our capacity of nuclear and renewable energy. But let me tell you an example of a country that doesn't often come to my mind, and this is a European country, Norway. So just to understand the position of African country, let's look at a country, Norway, that is the closest to the EU in everything, you know, culturally, uh, values, principles, legislations, regulations, you name it, yeah? Norway made it very clear in May, their Minister of Energy said it openly, if Europe commits to buying more gas, for the long term, we can help it replacing Russian gas. And that's why a month later, a month or two, if I'm not mistaken, the e, there was an EU-Norway energy cooperation where the EU openly said that it supports Norway's continuous exploration and production of oil and gas for 2030 and beyond. So that was a clear reassurance that the EU gave to Norway to say, you know what, we will continue buying your oil and gas, continue investing. Why would it be a different position for African countries, right? So African countries should also get same commitment from those, from the customers, from the European customers who are desperate for the gas, that they want to maintain their gas demand for many years to come. And if they don't want it, guess what? I mean, there is China on its own. If you look at the expected increase in the demand for China for the next few years, on its own, it could capture all the additional capacity expansion in liquefied natural gas and LNG. So this goes back to the point I said earlier about the globalization of gas markets. So it's not anymore Europe on its own telling producers, send me your gas. If Europe does not going, is not going to be more lenient and understand the position of oil and gas producers in Africa, Europe will lose it to Asian consumers who are very hungry for natural gas. As we approach COP27, it is important to consider the impact of recent developments on energy transition that we have been speaking about and implications for African producer countries and their energy transition plans. Uh, Tio, um, you have been uh, shared elsewhere uh, how wealthy you know, countries have not delivered on their climate finance promised to sub-Saharan African countries. Some people have suggested that African countries shouldn't pursue plans to extract gas. In a world of crisis and gas supply crisis, uh, balancing the climate crisis and gas supply crisis somewhat competing. So, um, and can be tricky. Uh, should, uh, you know, issues such as who gets to extract fossil fuels and which projects are financed be revisited in the pursuit of more equitable energy transition? Is Europe's sudden interest in African gas hypocritical? especially as Europe pressures African country to meet you know, uh, green goals or are potential revenues from gas deals really worth it? Uh, Theo, uh, you, you have spoken a lot about this. <laughs> yeah, very, very interesting question. And 
let me let me piggyback off what uh, Carol said earlier. I mean, the point is, if Norway can still put, produce oil and gas in 2030 and beyond, if the UK in their new energy strategy clearly outlined the role of oil and gas, even in the US, again, uh, oil and gas being uh, a mainstay, even in 2030 and beyond, then I ask myself, why must it be different for Africa in, in that sense? Um, because at the end of the day, what this crisis has shown uh, above all else is that energy security comes first. Um, and in that regard, um, Africa for that matter must also prioritize meeting its own domestic energy security needs. And then the rest of course for export to wherever the market may be. And um, as Carol actually told, told uh, us, the market is not necessarily in Europe. In, if you do a 30, 40 year demand projection, the market is elsewhere outside of Europe. Um, and the technology is actually also available now to even produce some of these fossil fuel resources and reduce the carbon intensity of that production process. So in my sort of limited world where I sit, I don't really see a disconnect between the climate objectives and energy security in terms of access and affordability, what we typically in the literature will call the energy trilemma um, in, in that regard. And more so for Africa, uh, because again, what this conflict has shown and even COVID has also shown is that we have very fragile energy systems. You have deepening or prevailing energy poverty on the continent and we need all the resources to be able to address those you know, uh, concerns around uh, energy uh, security. And in that regard, the fuel choice to plug that gap, I don't think African countries should be forced into the binary hole of having to choose between renewables and or uh, oil and gas uh, in, that, in that matter. Um, and again, when you even talk specifically uh, about the overall emissions, if you take Africa as a whole, um, it's actually less than 4% of the total you know, uh, CO2 emissions cumulatively to date. Um, so, and if you look even specifically within the um, energy systems of many African countries, I would argue it's largely already decarbonized with the exception of South Africa where coal is the most dominant. So in, in that regard, I, I think the issue of the just and equitable transition is very much paramount at the heart of uh, the continent, um, but it, it shouldn't be made to look as though you have to choose one particular technology option and or uh, the, the other. Um, and I think when it comes to the financing issues, again, this is where you see quite a bit of the uh, geopolitics also uh, at play. Um, so we know that uh, from some estimates, uh, including a fairly recent study done by the Climate Policy Initiative, that uh, Africa as a whole needs about 250 billion every year between 2020 and 2030. We're already two years into that. If you look at the last year's numbers and the flows, uh, the continent got just a little around 30 billion coming in, in terms of these uh, financing flows. And interestingly, most of them actually went into uh, mitigation, uh, less on uh, adaptation where uh, the uh, research also shows African countries are heavily exposed. And even on the financing flows, many of these are coming in as loans, you know, interest-bearing commercial loans and less as grants. So in a sense, uh, you see a lot of African countries caught in this quagmire, but I, I don't think that the solution should be one to force a, a technology choice on African countries when even in Europe, the main producers are still exploring the oil and gas deposits. And number two, 
the issue of the financing, I think, is going to be absolutely critical, uh, especially uh, at COP, um, where many of the financing flows would need to uh, be increased. Um, and when it comes to things of the mitigation financing, and of course, the other one, which I forgot to mention, the uh, issue of loss and damage for historical um, you know, uh, emissions. I cannot agree with you more than that. Um, in, indeed, uh, in, in recent uh, media appearance, my colleague, you know, uh, Thomas Caulfield also noted that uh, European Union and wealthy countries in general must meet their existing climate finance commitment before new European Union investment commitment and funding pledges can be taken seriously, particularly in Africa where they have not met those pledges. Um, yeah, and I think building on uh, sustainable and reliable domestic energy systems is another crucial aspect as just mentioned. And, 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 and I think in the EU energy strategy, this has not been clearly addressed. And by many of the uh, commentators, in the Western media also noted that. But today, you know, 600 million people in Africa still lack access to electricity. And uh, Europe wants to find as much gas as possible in Africa and other regions. It doesn't sufficiently support energy access or market references to the needs of diversified um, on the need to diversify uh, its own energy sources. I think, Carol, you mentioned this before. Um, what are and should be the priorities for export versus domestic consumption in Africa? And I would like to hear, as we were getting to the end, I'd like to hear from both of you. Maybe we go for um, Carol, you wanna chip in? Yeah, it's, um, for long, we always believed that in the case of gas in particular, and in the case of Africa especially, I think the priority should be given to the local market, to the domestic market, because you, if you want to really have economic development, you need to give access to energy. And you need to allow that access by developing local market, by putting the regulation, right regulations in place, right pricing systems in place to build the infrastructure, et cetera. So if you have the gas, and that's why gas by large, it remains a regional business and a big chunk of the gas produced is, the, is, is consumed locally. Why would it be any different in Africa? And I think the main problem in Africa is actually domestically because of the institutional side, because of the investment climate and these are things that they need the African countries need to really work on to improve the governance of the sector if they are to seize the opportunity the golden opportunity that no other country maybe has it in this way or at the same scale not only in terms of oil and gas resources and reserves but see us we forget that Africa is very rich in the critical minerals that are needed for the energy transition and that's why I go back to a point that Theo made about we don't need to choose between oil and gas and green energy because Africa is blessed with resources that allow the production of both to meet the energy transition while safeguarding energy security. But experience has showed us that it's not if you have the resources in the ground, you're going to benefit very well. I mean, look at Venezuela, they have the largest proven oil reserves in the world, and yet they are not among the largest oil producers in the world because of what is what was well known as the resource curse. So let me keep my answer brief to your question and say, the domestic market should take uh, a precedence, but that will not be developed automatically. You need to put in place the right institutional framework to allow that to happen so that everybody benefits from uh, the resources that you have an export market can be developed in parallel, but should not be given the priority over the domestic market. So, yeah, yeah just, just to add a bit to, to Carol's point, uh, and actually an, an interesting point, uh, we, we've been doing some bit of exercise just to see if you doubled Africa's current um, electricity output, um, 
to bridge the access deficit, how much more emissions would that contribute if you even had a major chunk of that coming by way of natural gas? And what is actually quite remarkable is that even if we double the output of power on the continent using the same energy mix as currently pertains, it's still going to contribute less than 5% of the total uh, cumulative greenhouse emissions in, in, that, in that regard. Um, and so the point here is that seeking to export gas from Africa for me is not necessarily a bad idea, but as Carol said, the important thing is also to develop the regional gas markets. Uh, I have been involved in a few studies and you can actually find that there are significant constraints uh, in terms of developing these uh, markets. However, we have an opportunity now with the Africa continental free trade area uh, to actually you know, work on some of these uh, issues such as having a harmonized uh, gas pricing uh, regime, uh, the issues about the investment requirements. And I think here, the, some of the sovereign world funds on the continent need to think about pulling some of their resources together. Because after all, if the money is not going to be coming from Europe and other places, if they decide to pull out the investment, we still need to develop these you know, uh, gas markets. And um, there are other pools of money, um, even domestically on the continent with the sovereign world funds, but also some of the pension funds, et cetera, uh, to put into some of these uh, you know, investments. And of course, you need to address all of the regulatory political risk issues um, and you know, ensuring that you are actually pricing the gas appropriately um, and doing that on the basis of what must go to industry and which ones must go to uh, for domestic uh, consumption uh, in, that, in that regard. Because if we don't do this, if we don't develop those regional gas markets and it's all about export, 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 then unfortunately it's still going to be, in my view, the same old colonial um, extractivist model which literally has dominated the geopolitical order for the last 400 years with very little trickle down effects for uh, livelihoods uh, on the continent. Thank you. So to what extent uh, do you think COP27 will be a moment for settling some of these questions? Uh, there are many questions still out there. Yeah, I, I think going into COP, there are three key things issue of energy access, uh, issue of uh, uh, climate financing, and, and all around the issue of the just transition. But I think really what is important here is that historically, Africa has not had a unified strategy uh, on most of these issues. So I think going into COP, we as a continent must present a unified strategy and the strategy should detail, in my view, our unique circumstances, uh, but also highlight the role that oil and gas it would play as an important uh, fuel choice for any uh, decarbonization pathway for the continent. I'm not talking about other continents, I'm only talking uh, specifically uh, about, about oil, um, uh, uh, about Africa. And in that regard, um, both oil and gas and renewables would for sure play uh, a, a, a big part of that agenda. I am just worried that the attempt to force this different you know, uh, pathway, like it's this and not that, is basically going to push a lot of the already existing uh, assets or uh, reserves and make them potentially even become stranded in the first instance. And that would already have a cascading impact uh, on the worst energy uh, poverty that you were talking about with about half of the continent not having access to uh, electricity. So um, the strategy is important, highlight the unique circumstances and also advocate for more of the uh, financing flows uh, on, the, on the continent. And lastly, um, things around the um, you know, transition critical minerals where 
Um, many of the countries on the continent have one form or the other, but to really make uh, an opportunity out of it, it must be developed on a regional uh, basis. Uh, over. Thank you, Caro and Theo, for joining me today for this episode of NRGI podcast. This has been a very interesting conversation, leaving us with a lot of food for thought on what really constitutes a just uh, transition. For our listeners, please do check out for the first two episodes on your uh, preferred platforms. We are on uh, a SoundCloud, YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. And do join us in the next episode. Thank you.